Hello, everybody. This is Sander Lutz from De Decrypt, and I'm joined by my colleague, Liz Napolitano. And we are here with uh, House Majority Whip Tom Emmer here in the thick of uh, Mainnet in New York City. Thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Sander. Can you hear me if I do this? I think loud and clear. All right. We got gotcha. you. All right. Um, so it's uh, we're in the thick of the 2024 election and presidential election. And you can see that flavor here. We have a lot of... Uh, legislators like yourself, a lot of Senate candidates, and that's, um, I guess, somewhat new for the crypto space and these types of conferences to have so much, uh, not DC flavor, I know you wouldn't say that, but you know, legislators here. Um, policy makers. Policy right? makers, I mean, yeah. One, one of the reasons is because this space, there is a huge group of voters, right? People vote. And you got a huge group in the 18 to 40 year old uh, range that this is their issue. So now you're starting to see the policymakers who are trying to get elected showing up at these conferences because and most of them are sincere. They want to learn more. They want to understand more. They want to actually be helpful, regardless of what their political persuasion is. I think you've got a growing number of people, both at the state level and now it's coming at the federal level, that are, are starting to get in tune. It's taken, I've been involved in this for nine years. And when I started, I, I think there were six of us. Now, I mean, we pretty much have pulled all of my Republican colleagues, pretty much, still have some naysayers. And my Democrat colleagues have been coming rapidly. In fact, uh, Maxine Waters, who has been a, uh, a, a devout opponent, I would argue, a worthy opponent, finally acknowledged this week, it's inevitable. This is going to happen. So. They're starting to, you know, the senior Democrats are starting to release their uh, more junior members to explore. And I, I think it's great that they're here at Mainnet. I think you're going to see them, more of us at a lot more of these conferences going forward. I have a question about that newfound Democratic support across the aisle in a second. But one thing about crypto in 2024 that also seems to be a major development is when you look at political spending, these super PACs like Fairshake, um, Fairshake itself has raised over $200 million this election cycle. It's the biggest special interest uh, political spender of any of any color. It, it's crypto this year. Um, recently, though, um, Fairshake has started spending a lot of money, sometimes for Republicans, but also for Democrats in key battleground states in, in Michigan, uh, in Arizona. Um, in Michigan, for example, zeroing in on that, um, Mike Rogers, who's also going to be here later today, um, you know, he's pretty pro crypto. Um, his opponent, Alyssa Slotkin, seemed more skeptical on the subject, now seems more pro. She ended up getting the funding $3 million, which makes a lot of difference in a battleground state. Good. Why do you think that is that uh, this crypto PAC spending has gotten to these Democratic candidates? Um, do you think that uh, was the right move, or, or what, what do you make of, of how these PACs are spending this election I'm cycle? I'm not going to tell uh, Andreessen and company how to spend their money. Uh, they created a PAC because they're looking for policymakers who are open-minded to the digital age, who are open-minded to the opportunities that exist and what we need to do to make sure that this grows right here in the United States. I, I don't think they look at it as Democrat, Republican. I think they look at it as, uh, are you with us on our issues? And uh, clearly, uh, Alyssa must have made the case uh, because they want to support her. Bernie Marino is, is an example in, uh, in uh, Ohio. Sherrod Brown is trying to tack back now, but he's been solidly with the Elizabeth Warren crowd. Uh, and Bernie Marino got tons of support from Fair Shake. So I, I, I don't think, it, for me, and I do campaigns, that's what I've done a lot of with the uh, Republicans in the House, uh, I do not look at Fair Shake as being a partisan organization. I think Fair Shake is literally, much like uh, APAC, for instance, uh, doesn't, it doesn't matter, Republican or Democrat. They just want people who are supportive of their issues. So, so you think with some of, these, uh, some of these races that those moves make sense to you, or you think those might be in the long-term best interest of the health of the crypto industry? I, I've never, to have crypto-friendly uh, members, yes, is the answer to that question. But for people like Alyssa Slotkin, I mean, I've never had dealings with her where she was particularly interested in this, but that doesn't mean she's not. And clearly she made her case to somebody that they thought that's a race that we should play in and we should support her. Now, there has been a lot of talk about there, become, there being an uptick in bipartisan support for crypto. You've alluded to it. You've spoken about it now. 
Um, what do you make of, uh, do you think that we need a Senate, given that there's more bipartisan support, more than 70 Democrats, you know, across the aisle to support Fit 21 in the House, do you think that it's still necessary for there to be like a Republican majority in the House and the Senate to really um, see a comprehensive crypto framework be passed by Congress? So where I come from, this is a nonpartisan issue. But I can tell you that uh, what I've seen, I told you about Republicans who have been coming to this issue now for the last six years. I've got Democrat colleagues who have been doing the same thing. Uh, obviously, I have a preference as to who wins. Uh, why? Because I'm very excited if we had the White House, we had the Senate, we had the House. We're going to finally be able to really make some moves when it comes to the digital asset space and stable coins and uh, this market structure stuff. But I would argue that it may be a little slower, but our colleagues on the other side of the aisle, not the rank and file, but these people in the White House and that have been listening to Elizabeth Warren and company, I think they have been waking up over the past several months to the fact that this is a really important issue to a really important group of voters in this country. And we need to start paying attention. So regardless of the outcome, I expect you to see uh, digital asset legislation start to move in both bodies. And do you think we'll get a regulatory framework within the next, let's say, year, two years? Well, that would be my hope. I, I still have some hope that the market structure bill, the Fit 21 bill, that uh, came out of Patrick McHenry's committee in the House and passed the floor with people like you said, 70 people, Democrats voting for it. Nancy Pelosi was one of them, right? I, I think that bill at the end of the year, if there's a end of the year spending deal, maybe some or some parts of that bill end up in the final deal. Uh, but even if it doesn't, I think in the next year, we're going to see some movement. So drilling down on that and the timeline, because like you said, Maxine Waters, all these people, the movers here, you know them well on the House Financial Service Committee. Um, it seems like there was some major shift that happened this summer, whereas there was a lot of hesitation for Democrats. And maybe you're saying that comes from permission from party elders to kind of jump ship a little bit and be more openly pro crypto with some of these votes like SAB 121, FIT 21. What was it that changed there? Like what was happening behind those closed doors? Was it fair shake throwing a lot of money around? Is it the fact that it's election year and it, this reached a tipping point of being an issue, a hill they didn't want to die on? Like, it, it seemed like that gate opened to some degree. And, and why do you think that was this summer? Uh, because I, I don't think it has anything to do with fair shake. Uh, what I think it has to do with is over the last four years, we expect this administration to be better than the last one in terms of moving digital asset stuff. They got worse. You got uh, Gary Gensler, who's been the single worst bully that could ever be in this space, uh, picking winners and losers. And if it weren't for all the court cases that he was losing and the embarrassment that he was feeling, I don't know that we would have been as far as we are right now with like spot ETFs and other things that he finally approved after he got his rear end handed to him by the courts. Uh, when it comes to this summer, I think the Biden administration, more importantly, I think the campaign people around the Biden campaign, which has now become the Harris campaign, I think they saw what we already knew. They saw that there's this voting block age 18 to 40, one out of five of them, and there's some data that shows it's more, this is the issue they're going to be voting on. And but, this is what's so important. But then it's funny, like with something like SAB 121, it's like clearly Nancy Pelosi got that memo, but then Biden ended up vetoing it anyway. Yeah, but so, Chuck Schumer was with us. I mean, yeah. pretty amazing when you looked at the, Demo at the Democrat senators that were voting to get rid of that rule. I actually thought because of that, that uh, they were finally going to show Gary Gensler and Elizabeth Warren the door and stop taking their advice because it's been so damaging to them politically. Uh, but who knows what happened in the White House? They ultimately, uh, <laughs> they stayed the course and we, we have this ridiculous rule that Gary Gensler is now starting to pick winners and losers. I guess BNY Mellon gets to uh, custody digital assets, but nobody else does. I think everybody should be allowed to be in the business. Now, speaking of the Biden turned uh, Kamala Harris campaign, uh, Harris recently said, I think it was last week, she said that uh, her would-be administration would uh, support innovation in, uh, I think it was AI and digital assets. 
What do you make of her uh, making her first explicit comment on crypto during uh, uh, leading up to the election? Well, the sad part is, and this is going to sound partisan, but it, the sad part is she is saying anything and everything she can right now to get elected. I mean, uh, hasn't done anything in the border for four years. Now that's going to be a number one thing. This one really concerns me. I think Democrats are moving in our direction on this issue, digital assets in the 21st century. My problem with this is, is it likely that Kamala Harris, if she's the president of the United States, leaves Gary Gensler in place or worse yet, moves him over to the Treasury? Right. You could have the same people littering the administration that we have right now, which I think would be holding us back. I don't know that that's the case, but I know on the other side that we've convinced uh, Donald Trump the time is now. This is I, I mean, this is why he's been so strong about I will be your crypto president. He did this months ago, uh, which is an interesting evolution from where his administration was the last time around. We had some friends in the administration, right? Hester Peirce. We had uh, Brian Brooks, we had Chris Giancarlo and others, but we didn't get the kind of movement that we wanted to get when the Trump administration was in place. I, we certainly haven't gotten it with this one. Uh, for her to say now that she's going to change the approach, I don't know. It, so in other she words, might, but you you got to roll the dice and take a gamble that she's going to. So in other words, it seems disingenuous to you that she's supporting, that she's saying that she will support crypto. I'm trying not to say that because I do think that when it comes to this issue, Democrats and Republicans tend to agree once they get into the meat of it. So my, my problem is she says one thing, but she's been doing something else. The administration has. I, I don't know that I want to take a chance. So that, do you think that the uh, current administration's record on crypto is indicative of what Kamala Harris will do? Could if be. She were elected? Could be. That's that's the risk, right? Either she's telling us, yes, I've had this conversion and it's we're going to do this. But who's around her? There's, what would she need to do? What would Kamala Harris need to do to uh, convince you that she is uh, committed to crypto? Well, the only way she's going to be able to convince me is if she's the president of the United States and she keeps her promise on this thing. I don't think she's going to be the president of the United States. Uh, but if she is, uh, if she kept her promise, OK, then I would sit here with both of you and go, good. I mean, she said this is what she was going to do and she's doing it. Problem is, people don't change like that overnight. It took four years, three years, the better part of three years, and the administration to get uh, the Republican candidate to this place, right? It doesn't just happen overnight. Uh, and just because you say something, the actions that we've seen over the last almost four years have told us a completely different story. Uh, now, lastly, just getting a bit into the game theory of where we're headed into 2025, actually trying to legislate this stuff and get it passed in both chambers and signed by the president. You mentioned Fit 21. What would you say is your, your top wish list of priorities to actually get passed and signed into law? You know, there's stuff with stable coins, a, a general regulatory framework, DeFi, et cetera. And I guess as a second part to that, like, how much does that come down to it being uh, Trump in the White House, a Republican controlled uh, Congress versus you said it might be a little slower with Democrats. But it seems like you're pot you feel enthusiastic, like there we've reached some critical mass here. It's it's more of a matter of when, not if it I seems think like it is when, not if I, I do agree with that, regardless of who's in charge. The question is, how quickly will it happen? I, I you know, the fact that uh, Maxine, that's that's actually a momentous statement by Maxine after the last several years that this is inevitable. All right, great. I, the, uh, I, I don't know. The, uh, at the end of the day, I've got three things. I got so many things that I could give you that we would like to see done. But if I have the opportunity with a Republican in the White House, Republicans controlling the Senate and Republicans controlling the House, one of the first things I'm going to do is make sure that my uh, anti-central bank digital currency bill, my prohibition on CBDCs, is not only passed out of the House and the Senate, but it's signed into law. We do not need to become a surveillance state. And that's exactly what that thing is for. Uh, we've got to stop it at all costs. Then I think a market structure bill, uh, the one that we've passed, I think is a good start. But I think there are other things we can do to lay out the rules of the road so people want to create things in the United States and invest in the United States. We don't want to do what Gary Gensler's been doing now for the last four years, which is pushing people out of the United States, uh, sending them to other places. 
and then I think uh, uh, the other top one would be finding a uh, stablecoin bill, uh, a law that literally would be a dollar-backed stablecoin that can be created anywhere in the world as long as it meets whatever the criteria are that the U.S. Tre U.S. Congress first, but then the Treasury and the uh, Treasury primarily when they enforce it that they recognize it. Could you imagine? the uh, cab driver in Brazil who would love to do business with U.S. dollars now being able to do business with U.S. dollars because he can use stable coins that are backed by U.S. dollars. Uh, this would have a transformational impact. But then there are other things. I believe in uh, uh, safe places, sandboxes. I hate the term. It sounds so childish, but places where people can invent and then safe harbors so that once you invent something and you see how it works and you may see what the issues are, where that you got to put guardrails on it. You don't punish that entrepreneur, that inventor. You give them the ability, you give Congress the ability to put those guardrails on and we move forward. Same thing with taxes. I don't want the IRS coming in after the fact and like redesignating projects and saying, oh, now you owe us all this money. No, I, you got to have safe harbors where people can be free to create and grow new op opportunities uh, without fear that their government's going to come in and uh, uh, take a shot at them after they've already got it moving. And so do you think that those more targeted uh, bills or legislation is kind of a prerequisite to getting ultimately to a comprehensive crypto regulatory framework? Well, see, I mean, that's a little down the line. Here's the problem. I, I think we've already got the framework. I think the, uh, the laws that we have, the finance, uh, we have banking laws, if you want to call them, that we've got on the books already need to be updated into the 21st century. That's the problem. I, I've got colleagues, uh, Republican colleagues in the Senate who have had ideas about, we got to create a new uh, regulatory uh, uh, department just to deal with crypto. Be careful what you wish for. You do not want that. What we need to do is our job, which is reform the government as it, as it exists right now. Many of these laws were uh, written following or on the heels of the Great Depression. I mean, they've been around since the 30s. Uh, we are in the 21st century. We're, we're approaching 100 years later. It's time that we update those laws. And the thing that excites me, Republicans, uh, just rank and file members, and Democrats, rank and file members, more and more, are they understand these issues and how important it is to get it right. And I think that's why it's going to change. Gotcha. Well, uh, Whip Emmer, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure you got plenty to get to, but appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, there's nothing like crypto, people. I love hanging out at these things. I was going to say, like, what can you be doing that's better than this? I, I used to say hockey guys are the best, but now I say crypto people are the best. The weirdest, the, the most unique, I mean, they're, they're just awesome. For a guy my age, it's like stepping back into time and going, look at the world that you guys have. It's awesome. I was going to say, there's probably something that it exists a crypto hockey overlap and that's probably <laughs> definitely weird and definitely idiosyncratic. I bet it is. Yeah. I bet it is. I'm going to create it if it doesn't. <laughs> Mark that down. All right. Awesome. Thanks guys.